Hello, welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video we will be continuing the discussion from last time of the difference between the mind and a computer. This time we are going to be looking a little bit more closely on the question of meaning or significance. What is it to be a sign? And how are the signs that are in computers and in the brain different from the signs which we call thoughts? Last time we saw that a computer state has no intrinsic meaning, but depends on how we humans choose to interpret it. A given state can mean 2, or 13, or 11, or even 4. Since the state has no intrinsic meaning, the computer can't know what it means, and if it can't know, then it certainly can't think. In this video we're going to be exploring this a little further, seeing what kind of intrinsic differences there are between computer and brain states on the one hand, and human thoughts on the other. Computer and brain states are both signs, and so to understand them, we need to look at the nature of signs to see their similarities and differences. Signs are means of knowing something beyond themselves. For example, smoke is a means of knowing fire, road signs are a means of knowing that the road curves up ahead, and foghorns are a means of knowing that there are unseen objects with which we might collide. All of these kinds of objects, smoke, road signs, sounds in the fog, words in a book, the smell of gas, all of them are only potential signifiers unless they actually cause somebody to know something. For example, when we say that smoke signifies fire, we're leaving something out. We're not telling how it is that smoke signifies fire. For smoke to actually signify fire, someone has to see it, and then think of the connection between smoke and fire, and finally they come to understand that there is an actual fire. So, if we take the person out of the loop, the smoke which could signify fire, doesn't actually signify anything. Thus, human interpreters are essential for signs to signify anything. In actual signification, we have three elements. We have the sign, we have the interpreter thinking, and we have the thing signified. Now let's think about a thought as a sign. A thought also points to something outside of itself. We can think of fire, and it points to fire. But it does so in a different way. Whereas there were three terms in the relationship by which smoke signified fire, in the relationship by which thought signifies fire, there are only two terms. There is the thought, and there is the fire signified. So there are two kinds of signs. There are those like fire and foghorns that signify by a three-term relationship. These are known as instrumental signs. Then there are thoughts that only require two terms to signify. These are called formal signs. So thoughts are a completely different kind of sign than external signs. When computers represent some data, they do so by means of external signs that require a human interpreter. The same is true of brain states. If a neurosurgeon is looking at the brain and finds a particular circuit which represents some thought or idea, he has to interpret that circuit in his own mind before it can signify anything. Since computer states and brain states don't signify things in the same way as thoughts, they are not thoughts. And computers and brains by themselves don't think. They process data. Our analysis so far has been very analytical and external. We need to supplement this by a phenomenological approach. Phenomenology is reflecting upon and analyzing our conscious experience. So we will be considering how our experience of ideas or formal signs differs from our experience of external or instrumental signs like stop signs and smoke. Let's think about how smoke signifies fire. Before smoke can signify fire, we have to recognize that it is smoke, that it is not a cloud or a dust storm on the horizon. In the same way, when we see a road sign, we have to grasp that the diamond is a road sign, and we have to grasp the figure out in order to know that it signifies that the road is going to turn ahead. So, for external or instrumental signs to signify, it is essential that we first grasp what they are in themselves, smoke or a road sign, before they can signify what they refer to. 
Ideas or formal signs work in a very different way. When we think fire, we don't have to first recognize that we have a thought in order for the thought of fire to refer to fire. It is only in retrospect, when we consider how it is that we know fire, that we come to understand that we know things by means of ideas. Thus, not only do external signs and ideas differ in the number of terms required for them to signify, but they also differ in our experience of how they do signify. Think about a brain state being viewed by a neuroscientist. He or she observes the firing of neurons, increased blood supply to certain areas of the brain, and so on. These are external signs. Now consider the point of view of the person whose brain it is. When we consider the content that may be encoded in a brain state, we don't consider what the brain state is in itself. In fact, we have no idea what it is. Rather, we consider the content directly and transparently, as it were, as content, as information, and not as a certain physical state, as though it were an external or instrumental sign. How we know the external world is a bit of a mystery. In fact, it's a mystery from many points of view. How it evolved is a mystery, and how the data in our brain represents the external world as opposed to a body state is a mystery. Neurophysiologist Antonio Di Masio argues that our knowledge of the external world started as neural representations of body state and evolved into representations of the external world as the sources of change in our body state. To ensure body survival as effectively as possible, nature, I suggest, stumbled on a highly effective solution, representing the outside world in terms of the modifications it causes in the body proper, that is, representing environment by modifying the primordial representations of the body proper whenever an interaction between organism and environment takes place. Accordingly, Environmental information is body state information, even though it may not be appreciated. For example, to see an apple is to experience an apple modifying our retina. Why is this an evolutionary mystery? It's an evolutionary mystery because evolution responds only to behavior. If we behave in the right way, then we'll survive, and if we don't, we won't. To behave in the right way, it's not necessary to have a representation of the external world. It's only necessary to properly respond to each stimulus that we receive. As our body state already contains all the information that we'll ever have, why not respond directly to the body state as opposed to going to the trouble of constructing a model of the external world and then responding to that model? That requires extra processing. The same state that represents our retina being modified by the apple is the state that represents the apple modifying our retina. So, how is it that we distinguish between the idea of our retina being modified and the apple modifying our retina? This is a mystery, because there's one physical state with two mental states corresponding to it. The same brain state that represents the modification of our retina represents the apple. That means, once again, that brain states and ideas cannot be the same thing. Thank you for watching, and please leave comments.